the first of many to come to Acts 4.33. The Holy Spirit, yeah. The Holy Spirit was so powerfully at work that he would gather us from the four corners of our county, Royal Oak, Rochester Hills, Brandon Township, White Lake, and Waterford, and everywhere in between, united one purpose to receive from Jesus Christ this morning. And so, I just want to say, welcome to the Grace Revolution. We are at 433 Church. Let's put our hands together and praise God for this special moment. after a passage, a, a book in the Bible. Can you guess what book in the Bible we'll be looking at this morning? Yes. 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 Where we may be. Let's turn to the book of Colossians together. We're going to be the book of Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. I, I love this first verse here in, in verse 9, where Paul writes, for in him Dwell in all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And, and there's so much in that one sentence. Paul is saying a mouthful. He says, what we possess, what we have in Jesus Christ, is the substance. It's no longer the shadow, the things that the ceremonial law uh, uh, was, was a shadow of. For example, the dwelling. The divine presence of God, the place of God's glory, of Shekinah glory, rested between the cherub and a cloud which covered the mercy seat. But now, Paul says, now his glory dwells in the person of our Redeemer, in him bodily. Paul is clearing up false teachings in the day. There was two false teachings that permeated uh, the people uh, in, uh, in uh, the people of uh, Colossus, Colossus and that they struggled with. The first was called docetism. It claimed that Jesus had no human body whatsoever. He only seemed to have one. That was what one of the prevailing thoughts of the day was. If that is true, if Jesus had no human body, then David Blaine, Chris Angel, the tricks of illusion have nothing on what Jesus was able to pull off. Before special effects and green screens, what a show he must have put on at the crucifixion if he had no body. And the labor pains that Mary went through, that must have been a nine-month bender at Taco Bell. Jesus touched people. People touched him. He bled. He wept. He walked. He breathed. And he died and rose from the grave. He even one time, or more than once, ordered food from Martha's catering service. <clears throat> so Paul says, in Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It clears up. Did Jesus have a body? What's Paul's answer? Yes. The other thought that was going on in this in the mindset back 2,000 years ago was Serinthianism. This guy, Serinthia, thought he, thought he was headed all together. And he taught that the Christ came upon Jesus at his baptism, but then it left him right before the resurrection. He said... Jesus and Christ were two separate beings. Paul saying, no, that's not true. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In that one way sentence, Paul dismisses and dismantles the prevailing thoughts in the day, the erroneous teaching that tried to establish himself. For us, we don't have to deal with that mindset. I've never had to engage somebody and say, Jesus Christ had a human body, and Jesus Christ is not two separate people. I've never had to argue that. But there are some things that Paul teaches in verse 10 that you and I, we do deal with. 
There are struggles that maybe we've had. There are things that have permeated the Christian church. And this is what I want to examine together. Let's look at verse 10. This is where I want to land at this morning. And you are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. You got your sermon notes. You are complete in Jesus. This is a fact to be enjoyed. It's not a status that we achieve. The confusion that's been brought about in churches, I love the sound of rumbling. That means people get their pens out. I love that. Does a half the part good. Uh, you, you've maybe been to a church before where a pastor will preach fire and brimstone. Strive to be holy. If you work long enough at your holiness, then maybe one day you will be righteous before God. That's false. You are right now, for those who believe in Jesus, you are holy, you are righteous, you are blameless, you are complete in Him. Completeness isn't something that we achieve. It is something that has been freely given to us. And so complete, in the Greek, Colossians 2.10, if you've got your Bible, some of your texts might read not complete, but fullness. You might use that word fullness. It's the Greek word pleirago. And a couple of things. Number one, it means you have been rendered perfect. Not, he's perfecting us. You are rendered perfect in Him. When God sees you, He sees you as He sees His Son, Jesus. Perfect. And you have been supplied liberally. Which means when we have this revelation that we are complete in Christ, it causes us to abound in Him. We lack nothing. I want to stop for a second. Just let that sink in. How awesome that is, what Paul is saying. About two months ago, God said, go and start a church. How many of us would say, but God, but God, there are some things I might need in order to start a church. I felt a little bit like Abram. Go to the land, I will show you. Go start a church. Where, God? I guess it's here at Boulder Point. <laughs> Many of you heard for the very first time a week ago today about this church. And you heard and you left the familiar behind. And you took steps of faith to come out to a place where you can find rest and grow and flourish in the victory that Jesus has given us. And so I'm amazed by your faith, the people that have come out. This is incredible to me. I'm not sure if you realize this or not, but every book, I've read a lot of books about church planning over the years. I've had classes on it. Every single book that I've ever read will say things like this. Let me share an excerpt with you. A minimum number of people for birthing a church is 50 people. A much better size, I love this, a much better size would be 200 or more. Good thing I don't listen to this book. God says go and start a church about two months ago. I'm not sure I had five people, let alone 50, and a better number would be 200. I'm sure a better number might have been 500. But I don't go off of this book. I go off of God's word that says that I'm complete and I lack nothing. That He is the one who supplies me liberally. He is the one that will cause this thing to abound. So I appreciate the experts. But I'm going to take stock in what God's word says over what anybody else wants to write. If God is my source, then why do I need X, Y, Z to all line up, to be in order, for us to come together and to worship together? I 
don't. I don't even care if we're in someone's basement or garage, and this is way better. Don't get me wrong. And this is just the start. But I'm completing Christ. We have everything we need to take those steps of faith. To take the steps of great faith with great, confident hope, a sense of excitement, a sense of expectation of what the future God is leading us into will look like. And as we stay true to our mission, oh my goodness, what this is going to look like in one year. God has already done immeasurably more than we could ask or even imagine. Acts 4.33 happening as Acts 4.33. I was asked about that this morning. What does that mean? And a lot of people will go, Acts, like, like an axe, like go and chop trees. And that's okay, it gets people talking. Acts 4.33 says, And with great power uh, was given to the apostles as a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And great grace was upon them all. The great grace was upon them because of what Jesus had done. And what they testified to, the resurrection, it gave them an awareness that I am complete in Christ. There's nothing that I need. Of course they went out with great power and God's grace was upon them. Because they had their focus right. They understood who they are in Jesus. I lack nothing. Grace is upon you. Here, here's the one thing. Your actions might not correspond to the fact that you are complete in Christ. And what that means, I want to, I want to illustrate that through soccer, through my son's soccer. I love this. This is how it came home to me. I hope this makes sense to you. Our actions might not correspond to the fact that we are complete in Jesus. And so, it took my son the whole soccer season until he finally scored a goal. I was so excited for him. I knew that he had the ability in him to score. It was in him already. I saw glimpses of it. When he started to get the spacing down. When he understood, don't wait to shoot the ball, but be aggressive. Charge forward. Get there before the goalie. Kick it. And score. You have it in you to be a goal scorer. Now go and do it. You lack nothing. When he believed it, when he believed that he could do it, is when he finally realized and stepped forward and kicked the ball and scored. It was funny because after he finally scored his last game, he said, It's Dad, I figured it out. He said, I think I can score every game. <laughs> the truth is, whether you're new to the faith or you've been a believer for a long time, the truth doesn't change. You are complete in Christ. You lack nothing. So go and score. You are not less complete than someone else uh, on God's team. They might have just walked it out longer. Maybe they put the ball in the net a few more times. But you are in union with him. He has supplied us liberally, and he has rendered us <clears throat> The problem is, we've been taught the wrong thing for a long time. That's why I'm so excited about this church, because we're kind of deconstructing what we think church is, or what we think church has to be. We're stripping all that away. We're focusing on God's Word and what it teaches. Paul teaches us that we are complete in Christ. It is already finished. Our starting line is Christ's finished work. That's what we start off at. But unfortunately, we've taken this starting line of Christ's finished work and we've placed it out there. And it's something to, to uh, try to obtain, to run for, to try to strive and achieve. And that's all wrong. God's point of view is that you are complete. Walk out that completeness. If you fall, if you fail, if you think you are incomplete, you are not. You are complete in Him. 
your failure does not incomplete you. And there's somebody famous that understands that. I want to take a look at somebody who gets the completeness in Christ. We work in a business of tough competitors. Not going. You don't need to hear all this part anyway. This is the sappy bit. You. And it's okay, because right there, all he said, all you needed to hear, Tom Cruise said, is. You complete me. And of course, he's saying it to Renee Zellweger. But he's owning. He's owning the statement. And if we would just. I love this. This is great. Please stay there. I need a table anyway. That in Christ, He has completed us. We are complete. It's not your actions, it's His action on our behalf. Here's the thing. I want this to sink in. If you're a child of God, and you come to God like a sinner, there's a text in Matthew, remember the guy that beat his chest, he said, be merciful to me, O God, a sinner. And people, Christians, have copied that. They'll go to God and they'll say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. They forget that they've been rendered perfect in Christ. They come to him in confusion. Are you a child addressing your heavenly father or are you a sinner addressing God? Because here's the thing. The Bible says one time we were all sinners. We were all far from God. And the correct way to approach God was God, be merciful to me, a sinner. <laughs> but God is not just God to us anymore. He is our Father. We are no longer sinners. We are saints because of Jesus. And so our cry to Him is, Abba, Father. And when we teach things like this, this is when the miracles begin to take place. The Holy Spirit bears witness to truth. When you know that you are complete in Christ, you do what? When you know you have been rendered perfect, what takes place in We don't have to run towards some, some goal, some end goal that we could never achieve. We rest in what He has done. You don't have to strive when the work is done. There is rest. There is no rest when you are trying to get something. Instead of praying for victory, pray from victory. Complete in Christ is the starting line, it's not the finish line that we're running towards. And so may our prayers be this way. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love me infinitely. I thank you that you are the one who finds no fault in me because of Jesus Christ. See first and see that first and foremost and watch how God responds to our prayers. When you come to him from an incorrect position, be merciful to me, O God, a sinner. There is distance there. And you're coming incorrectly. You're not coming as a saint. You're coming as a sinner. And God cannot own that law. For God to answer you incorrectly when you come with distance, instead of boldness of what Jesus has done, for God to answer you in that way would be owning to the very lie. Hebrews tells us, come boldly to the throne. Not come beating your chest. Oh, but be merciful. Come boldly, with confidence, to the throne of grace, that we may find mercy and grace to help in our time of need. Prayers being confident. Simply pray, Father. That's the word I want you to write down. In your prayer life. Father changes everything when we understand that He loves us. The new covenant isn't about our love for Him. It's about His love 
for us. And there's confidence when we know that He hears us and we find grace to help in our time of need. I want to show you something so miraculous here the rest of our time together. Something Jerry just proclaimed. I want us to be like Jerry McGuire leaving here. You complete me living our lives that way. John chapter 19. What was Jesus' last word? I got the cheat sheet right up there. It is finished, right? That's what, that's what Jesus said on the cross. It is finished. That is our starting point. When where Jesus cried, finished, we begin. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the cup was filled, full of our sins, full of the curse and our judgment. And he drank that cup dry, meaning there is no judgment of God upon us. That is the starting point in the life of a Christian. God's laws have been satisfied. God's holiness has been magnified. If you sinned according to the law, you had to die. And so, God was not going to compromise His holiness. He sent His Son to die in our place. And it magnified His holiness. God's love was expressed for sinful men. It is. What was Jesus' first words that were reported when He was 12 years old? Do you remember that? Said, didn't you know? Didn't you know? I must be about my father's business. His last words, it is. His father's business completed. What was the father's business? It was to have our sins forgiven on a judicious foundation. So our first words, go ahead and get the first words. It is finished. John 19. You're going to see a progression here. This is going to set you free so you own your completeness in Christ. So start with the finished work of Christ. The second thing. I love this. The disciples are hiding behind closed doors. Jesus had died. They're afraid. Jesus appears not as a ghost. They could touch him. He could eat. He shows up his wounds, the righteous foundation on which he was crucified for our sin. And he says to them, peace be unto you, John chapter 20. It's got to be in this order, people. Because peace that he gives is founded on the finished work that he has done. The definition of complete pleurado. You have been supplied liberally in Christ causes us to abound. His finished work leads us to receive His peace. So, John 21, let's go to the next point. One week after He rose from the dead, He's walking by the Sea of Galilee. His disciples are fishing. After He had finished breakfast with them, after He had some amazing egg McMuffins. <coughs> Gooey, gooey eggs, Canadian bacon. I doubt they have that. It's probably fish and some other stuff, but I'm trying to set the scene for you. He looks at Peter after he says to them, My peace be unto you. He asks him, Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me? And I want to give you the fourth one too, and then we're going we're gonna to bring it around home. And after he asks Peter, do you love me? He says, follow me. The true Christian life is predicated on number one. It is finished. You are complete in Christ. Your sins are forgiven. Past, present, and future. You are the righteousness of God in Jesus. And now that all of that has been accomplished for you, how do you feel? You have a sense of peace? Are you able to receive His peace when you understand that He's done everything for you? And so then he says, to, he says to Peter, he says, is there anything, and I'm going to ask you this question, church, is there anything about me, is there anything that you find 
lovely. Do you love me, church? Yes. We have one in the back. Yes. Then, follow me. You see how that works? But let me spin it around with how this has been taught. Because this is where we go so wrong. The traditional way of teaching this has been this. Why don't we go back? We'll go back, back to number one. Begin. I love my, my preaching, serious preacher voice. Begin by following Jesus. You know good, lazy people. Strive to follow Jesus. Read your Bible every day. More. More. You should be reading your Bible right now as I'm preaching. Pray harder, longer. You still got some thread left on your kneecaps of your jeans. Begin by following Jesus. And then do your best. Yeah, keep it going three, four. Then do your best. To love him. And then you will have peace when your work is finished. What? <laughs> it never is finished. What? It's a struggle for all of us because it's in the natural, it's not in the spiritual. When you fail, when you make a mistake, do you go to God telling him how lousy of a sinner you are? Or do you go to God boldly believing you are the righteousness of Christ Jesus? If you fall, get back up on your feet again. Walk tall, bold as a lion, because Jesus has made you righteous. The victorious Christian walk, where you enjoy intimacy with the Father, where you reign over sin, it begins by knowing that you are forever forgiven, righteous and complete in Christ. Our starting line is, it is finished. Everything you need for this life and the life to come, Christ has done. And so we don't pray for victory, we pray from victory. We don't hold on to Jesus, Jesus holds on to us. Religion is man's way of trying to reach up to God. God, I think I can build a ladder tall enough where I can give you a high five or a fist bump. But God says, oh no. I sent my son and I've reached down and I've saved humanity. I've done for you what you never could do for yourself. And so when you look at yourself, what do you see? Do you see someone who is imperfect and lacking in many areas? Or do you see yourself as someone who is whole and complete in Jesus? I'm waiting for a response. So let's, let's work this out. Let's work this out together. I know it's our first time together in this space. Say it, say this. Say, I have, I have been rendered, been rendered perfect. perfect. Alright, that was pretty good. Now let's try another one. Say, I have. I have been supplied, been supplied, liberally, liberally, in Jesus, in Jesus. There are many believers, and I'm going to wrap this up. You know it's great? I don't have the time clock, but I'm, I'm about done, because I want to sing some songs. We got communion too. We're going to take communion every week, every week. How can we not take communion every week? That's why he said, do and remember to me. What are we doing here? Are we remembering what Christ did or not? If we are, we should be taking this every single time we gather together. In fact, I can't wait to see you all start taking communion in your own home. I'm going to teach on that and preach on that next week. So we got that to look forward to. But there are many believers who see themselves as incomplete. This is because they're conscious of what? Their lack, their imperfections, they're focused on themselves, on, on how they messed up, how they're, 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 not, they're not doing what they think they should be doing. They say, there are so many things imperfect about me, Pastor Matt. How can I be complete if there are so many things that I'm lacking in? 
They see their weakness and they want to condemn themselves and feel inferior to others. The good news is that God does not see us the way that we see ourselves, the way that others may even look at us. He sees us already complete in Christ. In spite of our imperfections, He sees us as the new creations that we are, partakers of His divine nature, and more than conquerors over our faults. My friends, you are not going to be complete in Christ someday. You are already complete in Him today. And what remains for you is to walk daily in that completeness by believing it's true and confessing that right now, right now, that is what Jesus is to me. He has rendered me perfect, completely forgiven, completely righteous, complete favor and protection. And so don't lack, don't focus on the lack you see in your love. Instead, focus on how in Christ you are complete. At this very moment, see his strength, see his wholeness, see his soundness, see his completeness manifesting itself in your very life. Let us bow our heads.